All right. We're going to switch gears a little bit now and talk about pulseless electrical activity. And this is one of my favorite rhythms to think about because it's physiologically much more complex and interesting than V-fib and VTAC. And there's a broad differential that you're going to learn about. So what is PEA? PEA, again, stands for pulseless electrical activity. And what that means is that there is organized electrical conduction on the monitor normal looking QRS complexes with P waves and T waves and all the things you expect from a cardiac rhythm. However, there is clinically no pulse. So normal looking activity on the monitor, but no pulse when you actually palpate the neck. What is the single most important intervention for PEA? It's a little bit of a trick question. The most important intervention is to figure out what caused it and fix that. So unlike VFib and VTAC, where we do the same thing for everybody across the board, regardless of the cause, in the case of PEA, we're only going to be able to make our patient better if we can figure out the cause and treat it. Now, of course, we're going to provide supportive care in the meantime, but ultimately, our goal is going to be to make a diagnosis. There's two major mechanisms of PEA that I'd like you to be aware of. One is the empty heart. And the other is EMD, or electromechanical dissociation. And we're going to com compare and contrast these a little bit. So in the case of an empty heart, the heart is conducting normally. There's nothing wrong with the heart's conduction system. You know, if I were to get shot right now in the aorta and all of my blood volume were to pour out on the floor, there's nothing wrong with my heart. It's going to conduct perfectly normally. In the case of electromechanical dissociation, the heart is also conducting normally. Electrical activity in the heart is preserved. However, when the heart is empty, again, if I get shot in the aorta and all of my blood's on the floor, there's nothing wrong with my heart itself. So at least in the short term, it's going to keep contracting just as hard and fast as it can to try to perfuse my body. So contraction occurs and it's normal. However, that contraction ultimately is ineffective, right? Because no matter how hard the heart squeezes, if there's nothing inside of it, if my blood is on the floor and not inside the heart, the heart's not going to fill. It's not going to send blood out to the body. By contrast, in electromechanical dissociation, there are normal cardiac action potentials that yield the pretty spikes that we see on the cardiac monitor. However, these action potentials do not yield cardiac contraction. So the heart's conduction is normal, but the contraction is either absent or so impaired that it doesn't produce a pulse. Ultimately, empty heart PEA is caused either by hypovolemia, as I mentioned with the example of all of my blood volume being on the floor, or it can be caused by some kind of obstructive process that prevents the heart from filling. So examples of those are things like cardiac tamponade. You've got a big collection of blood around the heart. It physically compresses the heart. The heart can't fill normally, so it can't send blood out to the body normally. Same with tension pneumothorax, right? You have a huge high-pressure air collection in the chest. It's going to mechanically squish the heart and prevent normal filling. These are all empty heart forms of PEA. By contrast, Electromechanical dissociation is going to be caused by systemic derangements in the body. So these are going to be things that affect energy metabolism such that the heart is able to produce the energy to maintain normal conduction, but it's not able to maintain the energy to enable mechanical contraction. And as you can imagine, contraction requires a lot more metabolic energy than conduction. So it's going to be the thing to go in the setting of severe derangements of metabolism in the body. So what's your differential diagnosis of PEA? There's a common mnemonic that's used, which is the H's and the T's. And I'm going to tell you a secret. I don't love this because it doesn't force you to think about it physiologically, but a lot of students find it useful. So we'll go through them. Hypovolemia, like we already mentioned, if you don't have any blood volume, your heart's going to be empty, not, your heart's not going to um, have good output. Hypoxia, well, how do we make energy in the body? We make it out of oxygen and glucose. So if you're hypoxic, your aerobic metabolism is going to be ineffective and you're not going to be able to produce the normal amount of energy to drive cardiac contraction. So it's potentially a cause of PEA. Acidosis or hydrogen ion, because you know we had to make it start with an H. 
in that kind of situation, you know, there's different uh, optima for every process in the body. There's pH optimum, temperature optimum, and physiologic processes just don't work right when you have extreme uh, derangements of those optima. So in the case of profound acidosis, the heart actually can't squeeze normally. So even though conduction is uh, intact, the cardiac contraction is not. Hyper or hypokalemia, it has to be pretty profound, but severe derangements of potassium can actually precipitate PEA. Hypothermia, like I mentioned, for the same reason as acidosis, if the body's really, really cold, the heart's not going to be able to contract normally. We talked about tension pneumothorax as a cause of empty heart PEA, and the same for tamponade. There's a number of toxins um, that can potentially produce PEA by uncoupling um, energy metabolism from normal cardiac contraction. Massive MIs can cause such profound reduction in cardiac squeeze that you can't actually clinically detect a pulse. And massive PEs can cause such severe obstruction of normal pulmonary blood flow that they basically cause empty heart PEA the same way any other obstructive cause would. So, with PEA, it's even more important than with other types of cardiac arrest to understand the underlying cause and to identify what's going on. So you want to get as much information as you can about the circumstances that led up to the arrest. What was the patient doing when it happened? Did the patient have any symptoms beforehand? Did they suddenly clutch their chest and complain of pain? Or were they gasping for breath? Did they turn blue? Did they attempt suicide? Was there some type of trauma? All of these things will help you narrow the differential for PEA and treat the patient accordingly. For physical exam, it's especially important if you don't have a good history, which in many cases of cardiac arrest you won't. But if the patient has any signs of physical trauma when you look at them, maybe you're going to think more about hemorrhage as a potential cause of PEA or tension pneumothorax. If the patient's pregnant, that should make you think about pulmonary embolism. If they have a dialysis catheter hanging out of the chest, that's going to make you think about hyperkalemia, et cetera. So physical findings can potentially give you clues that will help narrow your differential and prioritize your treatments so that you can help the patient with PEA. Another nice adjunct we have nowadays is bedside ultrasound. So ultrasound is a great extension of physical exam. It allows us to look inside the body in ways that we couldn't before and identify in real time. Is there a pericardial effusion present or signs of tamponade? Is there evidence of a pneumothorax, which is seen by absence of lung sliding on ultrasound? Is there an abnormal cardiac ejection fraction? Maybe the heart's just barely beating. Maybe the IVC is really distended, suggesting that the patient is volume overloaded. Or maybe it's really collapsible and tiny, suggesting that they're dehydrated. So ultrasound is especially good for cardiac tamponade and pericardial effusion. This is an example of a cardiac ultrasound where you can see some of the chambers labeled. But most importantly, you see a large pericardial effusion, which is outlined here on the screen. And that's big enough that you would certainly want to perform a pericardiocentesis and get rid of that to see if that helps the heart beat more effectively and improves your cardiac output. There's also the inferior vena cava, which is a great overall indicator of your patient's volume status. So like I mentioned before, patients who are really volume depleted, either from dehydration, maybe from a diarrheal illness, or hemorrhage, blood loss, these patients will have very, very skinny, collapsible, inferior vena cavas. So if your vena cava is tiny, or if it collapses down to nothing when you breathe in deeply, that suggests a patient in need of volume. Whereas if your IVC is normal in caliber and it doesn't collapse down to nothing, or maybe it's even distended, that suggests that you're euvolemic or potentially even volume overloaded. So this can help kind of guide your thinking a little bit about the patient, and particularly for patients who um, have evidence of intravascular volume depletion. By giving them fluids or blood, you can potentially reverse their PEA. I didn't have an image to show you here, but I'll also just mention um, ultrasound is very commonly used to evaluate for tension pneumothoraces. Um, there's a number of tests that, uh, that you can do that'll help you quickly identify that at the bedside without moving the patient. <music>